All right, so let's get started. The topic for this lecture is first, non-forcible rape uh, and related to that, this uh, concept of acquaintance rape or date rape. And then also we'll talk uh, briefly about mens rea with respect to uh, rape, forcible rape. So with respect to the first topic, non-forcible rape, um, or no as force, according to your text, we have two cases for consideration here. And these cases present modern reformed approaches to forcible rape and also help us think about the legal definition of force. How much have we expanded that concept as a legal matter? And how do we understand the concept as a factual matter? More particularly, we might ask, does a defendant who ignored a verbal no from a complainant act with sufficient force required by a forcible rape statute? And again, uh, in this section, we're particularly talking about acquaintance rape cases because that scenario of a complainant saying no, which is then ignored and um, some sort of sexual contact then happens often arises in acquaintance or date rape cases. So two cases in this section, and as I did before, I'm going to take them out of order. And this time I take them out of order because MTS deals with teenagers and then Berkowitz deals with college students. And so I just think as a chronological developmental matter, maybe it's interesting to take a look at the law in that procession. So take a look at the first slide, MTS. Uh, in this case, uh, arising from the New, New Jersey Supreme Court in 1992, we have 17-year-old MTS who was charged in juvenile court with second-degree sexual assault of a 15-year-old girl. The statute that MTS is accused of violating required the government to prove three elements. First, an act of sexual penetration. Second, that the act have been with another person. And then third, with the use of physical force or coercion. So contrast this statute with those pre-reform traditional forcible assault statutes that we saw in Rusk and Alston. In the statute at issue here, also a second degree sexual assault statute, force is the only element. There is no requirement of proof of non-consent or against the will. As an aside, let me just uh, point out and focus in on the fact that this is a delinquency case. All right. And so if you recall from our very early conversations in the beginning of the semester, a delinquency case is that type of case in which a juvenile, often less than 18 years old, but in many places now less than 16 or 17 years old, uh, who is alleged to have engaged in conduct that would be criminal if the offense were committed by an adult. Let me say that again. A delinquency offense is that case in which a juvenile is alleged to have engaged in conduct that would be a criminal offense if that conduct had been committed by an adult. And again, we can think that um, across the board, fairly uniformity, the age of uh, being a juvenile ends at uh, 18. Right, but in some jurisdictions for the purposes of delinquency offenses, uh, youth who are either over 16 or 17 years old uh, might be considered adults and not juveniles. So there's just some variance in the age at which one remains a juvenile for a delinquency offense. So as a substantive and procedural matter, there are quite a few similarities between delinquency cases and the adult criminal cases that we have talked about. So I just um, uh, placed on this flow chart, uh, it's very small here, but if you recall it from the beginning of the semester, this procedural path of delinquency cases. And if you recall the conversation, um, I pointed out that the procedural path is quite similar to an adult criminal case. And it's that little portion on the bottom that I've circled. You can take a moment now or after you finish listening to the lecture to go back and look at the full size of that PowerPoint or that flow chart. Um, as well, the substantive doctrine is the same in a juvenile delinquency case as in an adult criminal case. So all of the concepts that we've been exploring during the course of the semester, as well as the elements 
in the statutory approach is all the same for delinquency cases as it is for crim adult criminal cases. And then finally, the burden of proof is the same as in an adult criminal case. A juvenile may be adjudicated delinquent if all elements of the charged offense are proven beyond a reasonable doubt. There are also some significant differences between delinquency and adult offenses, uh, most notably for our purposes, two issues. The first is that in delinquency cases, um, there is no federal constitutional right to a jury trial. All right, so many um, juvenile delinquency cases are adjudicated by a judge in a bench trial. They are not decided by a jury. Second, the disposition or what we would call the sentencing um, is arguably rehabilitative, not punitive. As we'll talk about at the end of the semester when we get to our punishment or sentencing conversation uh, in the adult criminal system, we are primarily focused on punishing individuals. Uh, theoretically, in the delinquency system, the goal is to rehabilitate the youth so that they can then proceed into um, uh, law-abiding adulthood. So, arguably, when the case is adjudicated and if the delinquent is adjudicated um, responsible or culpable, then the particular sentencing or punishment options will be rehabilitative. All right, so... That's the aside about delinquency cases. If you're wondering about uh, the similarities and the differences and to what extent um, those might factor into this decision. If you've got more questions, of course, post them on TWIN and I'll be happy to answer them. So in this case, um, MTS has been charged as a delinquent and uh, his case is heard by the juvenile court judge who ultimately concludes that MTS engaged in an act of sexual penetration to which the girl had not consented even though there was no evidence or suggestion that he used any unusual or extra force or threats to accomplish the act of penetration, all right? So MTS is adjudicated delinquent. The court found beyond a reasonable doubt that all of the elements of the statute for second degree sexual assault were satisfied, even though there was no evidence or suggestion that MTS used any unusual or additional or extra force or threats to accomplish the mere fact of vaginal penetration. MTS appeals and the Intermediate Appellate Court reverses, concluding that non-consensual penetration does not constitute sexual assault unless it is accompanied by some level of force more than that necessary to accomplish vaginal penetration, right? And that would seem to make logical sense if the basic elements of the statute include the act of sexual penetration with another person, with the use of physical force or coercion, then merely engaging in non-consensual vaginal penetration would be insufficient. The government is now unhappy with the outcome, which is a legally based decision, not a factual decision. And so the government appeals. And the issue on appeal here before New Jersey Supreme Court is whether the element of physical force is met simply by an act of non-consensual penetration involving no more force than necessary to accomplish that result. So the resolution of the issue should be quite familiar to you and give us a nice opportunity to revisit our conversations early in the semester about statutory interpretation, right? So step one, the court looked for a statutory definition of force and found none. Step two, the court determined that physical force was ambiguous and did not have a plain meaning, either common or legal. It understood that the government was offering a broad definition, any amount of involuntary sexual touching. The defendant, on the other hand, was offering a narrow definition requiring proof of violent force. The court looked at case law definitions and dictionary definitions and ultimately concludes that there is no obvious plain meaning of the term Hence, there is ambiguity, and so the court then engages in statutory interpretation. To resolve the question, the court looks to legislative intent. And in doing so, it reminds us that the rule of lenity is applicable. So the court should, if there are two or more reasonable uh, and, uh, interpretations, the court should adopt that interpretation, which is favorable to the defendant. The court then goes on to try and divine or identify the legislative intent. 
And to do so, it looks at English common law, traditional American common law, the circumstances surrounding and the reasons for reform of the traditional common law approach, various reform approaches, including elimination of the force element, elimination of the non-consent element, elimination of proof of resistance, placing the burden of proof regarding consent on the defendant. The court continues on by looking at rejection of the model penal codes approach, reference to assault and battery law, the harms that will be remedied by the criminalization of rape, and the reality of crimes. Ultimately, after looking at this fairly rich set of information, the court concludes as a matter of statutory interpretation that any act of sexual penetration engaged in by the defendant without the affirmative and freely given permission of the victim to the specific act of penetration constitutes the offense of sexual assault. So, as we've done before, right, let's consider the initial statutory elements in light of the court's conclusion with respect to statutory interpretation. In doing so, we would identify that after the court's decision, the government must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant vaginally penetrated another person and that the penetration was accomplished without the affirmative and freely given permission of the alleged victim. Further, if there is evidence to suggest the defendant reasonably believes such permission had been given, the state must then demonstrate either that the defendant did not actually believe that affirmative permission had been freely given or that such belief was unreasonable under all of the circumstances. All right, so if we take the court's conclusion after engaging in statutory interpretation and we overlay it onto the statutory elements and we consider the court's other admonitions about how to determine whether or not the defendant reasonably believed permission had been given, right, we have a pretty complex series of elements that the government must satisfy in order to convict. All right, that is very different from the plain text or the plain language of the statute. In the next case, we'll explore this uh, issue of reasonableness, but I want to make note now of a few things um, uh, that result from the New Jersey Supreme Court's opinion, separate and apart from reasonableness. So one, notice the court doesn't further clarify the meaning of affirmative and freely given. And the court does not define how much force or coercion must be used. On its facts, the court determines that in this particular case to reverse the intermediate appellate court, meaning it reinstates the delinquency offense adjudication, right? So recall at the trial court level, MTS is adjudicated delinquent. At the intermediate court level, the conclusion is reversed. And so the New Jersey Supreme Court reinstates the adjudication of the delinquency offense. Another point to take notice of is the scope of the judicially interpreted force element. In other words, how can the government prove the defendant did not have permission? What must the government do? So the government is not required to prove the complainant physically resisted the defendant's efforts to engage in vaginal penetration and the defendant overcame that resistance and was able to engage in penetration, right? That is the standard we saw in Rusk and Alston, but that is not the standard set forth here in MTS. Of course, if the government could prove the complainant physically resisted, then that would be sufficient to prove the force element unless the defendant in, had a good faith and reasonable belief that he had permission in light of his circumstances. All right, so to recap this last point, the government is not required to prove physical resistance and that the defendant overcame that resistance. The government might be able to do so, and if so, that would be sufficient unless the defendant were able to demonstrate a good faith and reasonable belief that he had permission in light of the circumstances. So next point to take away, 
the government is not required to prove the complainant told the defendant, no, I do not want to engage in sexual relations. All right, so a complainant is not required to expressly and clearly use the term no and tell the defendant she does not want to engage in sexual relations. Of course, if the government has that type of evidence that the complainant told the defendant no, then that would be sufficient to prove force unless, as we've seen before, the defendant can demonstrate that in good faith and reasonably he believed that he had permission. Also take note that after the court's decision, if the defendant proves the complainant said nothing during the events giving rise to the charge, right, the court could conclude that the government has proven force unless the defendant had a good faith and reasonable belief that he had permission. So in other words, if the complainant says nothing, the defendant might try to argue then he has not committed second degree sexual assault based on the court's interpretation of that statute. But the court's decision here suggests that a trial court could in fact conclude that the government has sufficiently proven force based on an analysis of the other facts Unless, of course, the defendant in good faith and reasonably believed that he had permission. All right, so what I've tried to do here is unpack several possible scenarios, right? And whether or not those scenarios could still allow for a finding of second degree sexual assault. So those scenarios include if there is physical resistance on the part of the claim complainant, or if the complainant expressly and clearly says, no, I do not want to engage in sexual conduct. In other words, clearly and unequivocally does not indicate consent or indicates non-consent, or if the complainant says nothing. In each of these circumstances, the government is not necessarily prevented from convicting the defendant, or in this case, adjudicating the um, child responsible. Okay, consider another scenario. Assume the defendant were able to offer evidence that he said, I'm going to have intercourse with you at the count of 10 unless you indicate to the contrary. And he slowly counts down. The complainant says nothing and does nothing to affirmatively respond and the defendant engages in sexual penetration without any additional level of violence. Could the court conclude that the force element has been satisfied? Yes. The complainant hasn't given permission either verbally or by affirmative actions. And based on that scenario, which I suggest might be a little bit of an unlikely scenario, but strange things happen. Uh, any belief the defendant had with respect to permission is likely unreasonable. Okay, one last scenario. Assume the defendant could show that the complainant affirmatively gave permission, either verbally or through her actions, to engage in sexual foreplay. Could the court conclude the government had sufficiently proven the force element for a second degree assault charge, second degree sexual assault charge? The answer would be yes. Permission to engage in something less than sexual penetration is insufficient to satisfy the standard the court has set out. All right, so at the end of the day, by working through these various um, different factual scenarios, what I'm trying to suggest is that in light of the judici judicially defined standard, force can be sufficiently proven by just the very minimal level of force required to penetrate and the burden is on the defendant to obtain an affirmative, unambiguous yes to sexual penetration before proceeding. Right, so let me say that again. In light of the judicially interpreted or defined standard, force can be sufficiently proven by just the very minimal level of force required to vaginally penetrate. All right, which was initially the issue that was raised by MTS on appeal, right? How much force has to be used? 
can you be found responsible for second degree sexual assault if there is no more force necessary than that to accomplish the penetration? All right, and the answer to that question seems to be yes. Additionally, the court imposes on um, uh, uh, defendants the burden to demonstrate that the defendant obtained an affirmative, unambiguous yes to sexual penetration before proceeding. Okay, so now if we understand how the court interpreted the force element and how that force element might be applied in some various scenarios, consider a different outcome. Is there an argument to be made that the court's statutory interpretation is doctrinally incorrect? Can we critique the outcome of this decision? In other words, is the court's conclusion as to statutory interpretation cons consistent with legislative intent or inconsistent? It might be possible, I would suggest to you, that it is inconsistent with the language of the statute and legislative history. Notice the New Jersey legislature eliminated the requirement that the government prove victim non-consent. This is a second degree sexual assault statute that on its face only requires proof of force. The court's interpretation though essentially eliminates the force requirement and places all of the focus on the victims, the complainants, non-consent. So I would suggest to you that what the court did through its process of interpretation is convert a force-based statute into a non-consent-based statute. Think about that. One of our concerns when we talked about statutory interpretation and the legality principle is that courts would interpret statutes in ways that are inconsistent with legislative intent. And that seems to be the case here in MTS. Okay, so at the end of the day, MTS is adjudicated responsible and the New Jersey Supreme Court uh, interprets the second degree sexual assault statute to require affirmative freely given permission, or should I say that their, the defendant had affirmative and freely given permission from the victim to engage in the specific act of penetration. All right, and so this is a much more modern interpretation of a forcible sexual assault statute than we saw in either Rusk or in Alston. And of course, you might take issue with the facts of the case and um, understanding um, how this scenario could have arisen, how to interpret the behavior of both parties. And if you like, we can talk about that um, uh, on Twen in the forum. So, Next slide, and here we talk about the Berkowitz case. And again, this is a case involving a forcible rape charge, this time from Pennsylvania. And the decision is from the Pennsylvania Superior Court in Intermediate Appellate Court. The statutory elements of the charge at issue include the defendant engaged in sexual intercourse with another person, that person was not his spouse, and he did so by forcible compulsion or by threat of forcible compulsion that would prevent resistance by a person of reasonable resolution. All right, so those are the basic statutory elements for the rape charge. There was also an additional statute related to this case, and that provision provides the victim need not resist for prosecution to be sustained. Said another way, the government need not prove resistance in order to prove this particular forcible rape change. There is no element of resistance. And as we talked about in the Rusk case, right, why might a jurisdiction eliminate the resistance requirement? Right here, the purpose of the rule was to prevent drawing adverse 
inferences against victims who, while being forcibly compelled to engage in intercourse, choose not to physically resist. All right, so we don't want to eliminate a complainant's allegation or refuse to credit a complainant's allegations simply because she chose not to physically resist. All right, there is some precedent the court points to as to give further meaning to the statutory elements. So the term forcible compulsion has previously been interpreted in other decisions. Forcible compulsion includes not only physical force, but also moral, psychological, or intellectual force. And threat of forcible compulsion that would prevent resistance by a person of reasonable resolution has also previously been interpreted in other decisions. And in those other decisions, the court has established that it is an objective standard. All right, so we're looking for the reasonable person. Two additional points of note, the reasonable person standard only applies to the threat of forcible compulsion element, not the forcible compulsion variant. And it's also worth noting that we're not given any further explanation as to whether or not that reasonable person is a woman of reasonable resolution or man of reasonable resolution and what it even means to be of reasonable resolution. Finally, the court points out that there is precedent indicating that whether force or threat of force was used is determined based on the totality of the circumstances. All right, so there are a number of possible factors that might be considered depending on whether they're relevant to the case, including the age of the parties, the mental and physical conditions of the parties at the time, the setting, the authority of the defendant, the custodial status of the victim, the possibility of duress, all right? Um, but this is a non-exhaustive, non-exclusive list. So those are some of the potentially relevant factors, but there might be others that have not been specifically identified. And when we say that the standard is a totality of the circumstances, it's a holistic determination, looking at all of the particular relevant factors and weighing them collectively to achieve a particular outcome. So that was the state of the law that applied to the defendant in this particular case, Berkowitz. Uh, he proceeded to trial and at trial he was convicted and ultimately then sentenced to one to four years on the rape charge. He appealed. And so here we're reading the decision of the Intermediate Appellate Court, as I previously mentioned. And the issue is whether the facts are sufficient to demonstrate forcible rape. So in MTS, we were asked to consider, or I should say the court was asked to consider a legal question, how to interpret the force element of the particular statute at issue. Here, the doctrine is already quite clear for the court. And now what we have is sufficiency of the evidence challenge. Were the facts sufficient to demonstrate forcible rape? So it's important to take note here that the prosecution's theory of guilt is that the defendant used actual physical force, right? That the defendant engaged in forcible compulsion, right? The government's theory is not one of threat of forcible compulsion. It is not one of psychological force or coercion or duress, right? That's a very important point to take note of. Another important point to take note of is one we have encountered before, which is that appellate courts should not be in the business of invading the province of a lower court or a jury. So overturning a jury verdict should be a rare circumstance. Nevertheless, the court here reverses the forcible rape conviction, concluding there is insufficient evidence of actual physical force. Instead, the court concludes that the facts of the case are consistent with consensual sex. The facts are consistent with the amount of force used for consensual sex. The victim could have left the room if she wanted and force was not used to keep her in the room. And then finally, and uh, significantly, 
The fact that defendant ignored the victim's nose by itself cannot support a finding of force. The victim says that she was saying no in a scolding, non-consensual manner, but defendant says that he heard the nose as passionate sex talk. And the court concludes that verbal resistance is relevant to non-consent, but when ignored by a defendant is not by itself sufficient evidence of the force element. So again, I remind you that the government's theory of guilt is that the defendant used actual physical force. All right, and so ultimately the court reviews the facts and determines there is insufficient evidence of actual physical force. The court then goes on to advise that if the statute criminalized non-consensual intercourse, rather than sexual intercourse resulting from forcible compulsion or threat of forcible compulsion, a guilty verdict could have been maintained. But that is not the statute with which the defendant is charged. He was not charged with a non-consensual intercourse-based statute. He was charged with a force-based statute. Again, look at the plain text of the statute. There is no requirement the government prove non-consent. And precedent had not interpreted the statute to require proof of non-consent. So this is uh, what many would have called or many have called a close case, meaning that reasonable people, jurors, may disagree on the verdict. And this is often the way in which cases of acquaintance rape or date rape are characterized. So one question for you to think about is if you were the prosecutor handling the case, and assume the case had been reversed, just it was as it was uh, in reality, how would you defend your charging decision to the public? If you came out after hearing the court's decision uh, and had to do a press conference, how would you defend charging this particular case, even though ultimately the intermediate appellate court reverses? Another way to ask this question is, if you were the prosecutor handling this case and had made the decision to charge, what factors might have guided you in your decision to charge forcible sexual assault? Think about that and post your ideas on TWIN. And then of course, if you're the defense attorney, what would have been your response as to why prosecution was unwarranted? Why this case should have never been brought in the first instance? Okay, so I can give you a, a postscript on Berkowitz. Actually, it's in the notes after the case. Um, and you're told that uh, although Berkowitz was um, uh, not guilty of forcible sexual assault, right, he was convicted of uh, indecent assault. Um, and as well, we see this concept of the legislature in response to the decision or after the decision enacting a new crime of non-forcible, non-consensual sexual intercourse, meaning non-forcible rape and attaching to it um, a 10 year possible sentence. All right, so this is an instance in which the legislature responded to the judiciary's uh, decision and created a new crime, here one based solely on non-consent. Okay, so take a look at the next slide, which brings us to a brief conversation about mens rea, right? In this uh, short section through the Lopez er excerpt, we revisit many of the abstract concepts we discussed early in the semester. This time, we look at mens rea and mistake in the context of forcible rape, right? Recall um, when we were talking about mens rea, generally speaking, we learned that forcible rape statutes commonly do not have an express mens rea element within the language of the statute, but yet they are not strict liability crimes. As a matter of statutory interpretation, we infer a mens rea element 
And under a traditional common law approach, we conclude that forcible rape is a general intent crime. So the defendant has to act with a wrongful mindset, respecting the complainant's non-consent. So in the archetypal stranger forcible rape case involving violent physical force, mens rea is rarely an issue. The defendant's use of force or a threat of force or a victim's physical resistance is sufficient to put the defendant on notice that the complainant does not consent. And the defendant's continuation of his conduct despite that resistance or with the use of force leads logically to the conclusion that the defendant had a wrongful mindset. And any confusion or mistake about that non-consent would likely be unreasonable. But in the context of acquaintance rape or date rape, or when there is some familiarity between the defendant and the complaining victim, um, determination of whether or not the mens rea has been satisfied, whether or not the mens rea exists is more difficult because of the complexities of human interactions, because of the familiarity of the parties involved. So in a majority of jurisdictions, which adopt the general intent approach to mens rea in the context of forcible rape, a good faith and reasonable mistake regarding a victim's non-consent may negate the general mens rea requirement, right? This should remind you of our conversations about mistake and the categorical approach that was taken at common law. A general intent crime can be defended on the grounds of a good faith reasonable mistake. A specific intent crime can be defended on the grounds of a good faith mistake. So here, if a defendant engages in the prohibited sex act due to a good faith reasonable mistake as to the victim's consent, then the defendant lacks mens rea and is not guilty. Here, the victim did not consent, but the defendant genuinely and reasonably believed the victim did. Of course, as we've seen before now, um, in a number of contexts, um, consideration of the mistake defense requires determination as to who is the reasonable person in the context of sexual assault crimes. And we don't have a good answer to that question. Maybe we should think more about the question. For example, in light of social science evidence indicating that males and females differently perceive sexual behavior and have misunderstandings about sexual behavior, should the standard be the reasonable female or the reasonable male or some objectively reasonable person, however we identify or characterize that person? All right, but so as we've seen before and as I tried to suggest before, get comfortable with the notion that the reasonable person requirement within the criminal law is not very well defined and is not very well articulated. So get comfortable with the discomfort. I don't have clear answers for you about what or who a reasonable person is. The law doesn't have answers to that question. So one other point to make clear before discussion of Lopez, which is that please be mindful that a mistake defense is contrasted from a scenario in which the government fails to prove non-consent when it would be required to do so. It is also contrasted from a scenario in which the defendant claims the victim actually consented, All right? So a mistake defense is not the same as arguing the defendant, excuse me, the government has failed to prove non-consent as an element. And a mistake defense is not the same as defending on the grounds that the victim actually consented. So Lopez is an interesting and somewhat um, uh, difficult case to square in one's mind, Lopez seemingly rejects the majority rule that a good faith reasonable mistake regarding a victim's lack of consent is a defense. So why do I say seemingly? 
on one hand, the court is applying the statute of the jurisdiction, and that statute does not have an express mens rea element. As a result, the court appears to be concluding that the government does not need to prove mens rea on the part of a defendant as to the victim's lack of consent. Therefore, there would be no basis for a mistake claim. All right, so I'm taking this conclusion from the middle of page 480. The government must prove lack of consent, but the government need not prove the defendant intended to commit the act without consent. All right, so the court here adopts the minority approach, it rejects the majority rule that a good faith, reasonable mistake of fact regarding the victim's lack of consent is a defense. Notwithstanding what is quite a clear holding and decision, the court says in the last paragraph of the opinion that this case does not persuade us that we should recognize a mistake of fact as to consent as a defense to rape in all cases. So what that seems to suggest is that there are some circumstances in which the court would recognize a mistake defense. So what is it about this opinion that leads the court to conclude that there cannot be a mistake defense? What do the facts of the case suggest? How might we distinguish this case in which the court rejects a mistake defense, rejects the possibility of a good faith reasonable mistake from a future case in which the court seems to suggest that maybe it could recognize a defense in some circumstances? How do you reconcile the two seemingly incongruous positions taken by the court in the same opinion. Taking a look at note four on page 482 might provide some thought. So one final postscript here on Lopez, even though the majority of jurisdictions permit a mistake defense as a matter of law, the defendant is not automatically entitled to the defense. The defendant must produce evidence sufficient to warrant consideration of the mistake defense. It is not uncommon for a court to deny a defendant's request for a mistake instruction. On the ground and in practice, courts often set the bar fairly high for defendants to produce sufficient evidence to issue the instruction to the jury. In other words, courts make it difficult for defendants to use the mistake defense. So this section generally has focused on the common approach to mens rea and forcible sexual assault cases, right? Generally speaking, it's viewed as a general intent crime. And a good faith, reasonable mistake as to the complainant's lack of consent may be, be a defense. There are a few jurisdictions that have modernized their approach to mens rea and use an elemental approach. And um, in those jurisdictions, the mens rea requirement might be set at either recklessness or negligence. There's just some variance. So in those jurisdictions, you would just identify the applicable statute and research the case law or look for a statutory provision. And as we've seen before, if you take simply an elemental approach to mens rea, mistake defenses are permitted to the extent that the mistake negates the mens rea element. All right, and again, all of this should just be a refresher from our earlier conversations about mens rea. Okay, so to conclude this particular lecture, there's one last slide which presents to you uh, a problem based on the Mike Tyson case, which some of you might be familiar with. It's um, a fairly old case at this particular point uh, in time, uh, but the basic facts are set out in the slide. Uh, and so uh, on your own or with somebody, um, consider 
what might be the arguments for guilt if you are representing the government. Um, and I would say also guilt of what? What would you charge him with? And if, what particular statutory provisions and judicial interpretations that we've seen might apply? And how would you analyze guilt? And uh, if you're representing the defendant, Mike Tyson, what would be your arguments for not guilty? And we can talk about this on twin. The last thing to do for this particular topic um, is to take a look at a TED talk that I posted a link to on twin. All right, that TED talk is entitled Our Story of Rape and Reconciliation. So watch the presentation and then um, consider two things. First, based on the stories that each person in the talk tells about the sexual assault incident, what challenges, either legal or factual, would there be if the case were prosecuted? Alternatively, what legal or factual defenses could be raised? All right, so based on the stories told in the TED Talk, what would be your argument if you were considering prosecuting the case? And what would be the defenses that might be raised? The other question to consider is, after hearing the talk, do you think that Tom needs or deserves punishment? Why or why not? This is an opportunity for us to begin to think about the topic of punishment and sentencing. So if you heard the stories that were told, how would you think about whether or not Tom needs or deserves punishment? Does he deserve criminal condemnation? Does he need to be charged and possibly convicted? Why or why not? Let's talk on twin.